All right. So I'm going to talk about chapter three from the master and his emissary. This chapter differs from previous chapters in that, as it says right here, there's definitely more speculation here than there was in chapters one and two. In fact, he starts the chapter uh, with this quote, and what has gone before I have deliver deliberately followed neuropsychological practice and focusing on a set of discrete tasks or functions that can be defined and measured. So basically the stuff he's talked about before was keeping in line with neuropsychological science practice, um, which is about good operational definitions and measuring things. Since that's the way knowledge about the brain has been gathered. And that's the way people, our society thinks about the brain, by defining terms and measuring things carefully. That's science. I now want to look at this material, hemispheric differences, in a different light. I want to draw it together. Another way of thinking about this, kind of integrate, and suggest that hemispheric differences are not just a curiosity with no further significance, a bunch of neuropsychological facts, but they actually represent something coherent, two different things. Each is individually coherent, but the two things are incompatible aspects of the world. And so this approach is interesting because it's a departure from the way things were talked about in chapter one and chapter two. Chapter one and chapter two, there wasn't as much speculation. As he says here, it was more like a, you know, describing the facts, the scientific literature on hemispheric differences is based, that's how I think of it. Chapter one and two was basically a review of the scientific literature, the, the, the cognitive neuroscience literature on hemispheric, functional hemispheric differences. In chapter three though, this chapter, he starts to speculate more. And part of that, as he says, I want to draw it together. I want to integrate, he wants to integrate those facts that he talked about previously and kind of produce something more than those facts by themselves reveal. Um, so he's moving beyond just the facts in this chapter. He's now, he has this collection of facts and he's now trying to make generalizations about them. He's trying to see the, the bigger picture regarding those facts. So this is definitely the start. This is this idea is important for option one because part of option one described from the textbook is Anago. Then you're going to describe the topic from McGilchrist. When you're talking about McGilchrist, you want to talk about some of those speculations that are, especially you want to talk about those big picture speculations, which are kind of the main goals and parts of the book. And then you want to talk about the similarities and differences between kind of the two authors, where do the authors converge in their ideas and what are the differences? That's kind of the main approach. So they're talking about these speculations, which really begin, really, he really starts digging into the speculations here in chapter three. He's taking those facts from previous chapters about hemispheric scientific facts. And now he's moving, he's making generalizations, which go beyond the facts. He's generalizing and He's making claims that are not supported by any individual studies, kind of taking the collection of studies and trying to find like, what, what are they all saying together? So I'll talk about some of these here. First fact is he talks about each hemisphere possesses its own unique way of knowing. And I'll talk about that in the next slide here in a little bit more detail. Um, actually, yeah, I'll go do that now, why not? So here are the two different ways of knowing. Wissen, knowledge of facts, or bits, it's kind of a synonym for facts. This is like what chapters one and two were. It's a lot of Wissen style of knowledge. And by the way, this is a style of knowledge which is more closely associated with the, the left hemisphere. And it's clear that, clear that that's what McGilchrist thinks. And very, a lot of close quotes in the book suggest that. Um, the, uh, Wissen, this type of knowledge can be described with general terms. What's meant by general terms, words, measurements, which is definitely like the scientific style of knowledge is, you know, scientific papers describe thing in words, the results sections use measurements. That's scientific knowledge is all about words and measurements. That's where really what it comes down to. 
that's Vissen. Um, this type of knowledge associated with the left hemisphere instills a sense of category membership. And category membership is definitely important to scientific reasoning. Every study has to categorize things according to an independent variable, you know, a factor, quasi-independent variable or an independent variable. That's, those are like, for instance, we, we talked about, you know, examples early in semester, do a study, you have to categorize participants as being a person with, who's a control participant or a person that has schizophrenia, a person who's a control participant or is a, a person with depression. That's categorizing. And all experiments, every scientific experiment has to categorize the different elements of the experiment. That's kind of the basis for scientific reasoning is you have these different things and that you categorize them as one thing or the other. Every single independent variable is, uh, is basically of that nature. Categorizing something as one thing or the other, which is this Vissen knowledge. He talks about either or style of knowledge, categorizing things. Oh, and similar, a similar synonym for this category membership would be these terms he also uses abstraction or representation. Abstractions and representations are the categories. Categories, including independent variables, factors, are composed of individuals, of elements. When we're talking about the Wissen, talking about the left hemisphere style of knowing, talk about category membership, those categories, those are abstractions. Categories are abstractions. Categories are the representations. They're composed of individuals, but the Wissen is not about the individuals. The Wissen is about the category to which individuals belong. Don't actually care about the individuals at all in this Wissen style of knowing. You just care about what category those individuals belong to, which is basically the same. Categories are an abstraction. Categories are representation. So these three terms, category, abstraction, representation, basically all mean the same thing. Um, the Levison, the left hemisphere style of knowing, emotionally disengaged. A lot of literature in the previous studies suggested this. The right hemisphere was suggested to be more, more emotional than the left hemisphere. Vissen, it makes you perceive things in the world. It instills a sense of machination, non-livingness, things this style of knowledge makes things appear more like a machine than they do a person. There's like an emotional distance from the thing that you are knowing when you're using the left hemisphere style of knowing. And he also uses this way of describing things fixed or static. Unmoving is the style of the left hemisphere. He sometimes talks about being um, abstracted from context. Um, another he uses this idea of, of grasping. Take something that's out there in the world, which is part of the moving, flowing world. You take it in your hand, you make it still so you can so you can know the thing. You have to take it out of its kind of flowing natural state. And then you hold it, you you know, squeeze it in your hand, it's still. And that is the way of knowing of the left hemisphere, this Vissen style of knowing. So some examples of this uh, with respect to, and these are examples from the book, or some, well, they're based on an example in the book. He talks about the different ways of knowing a person. You can know a person with, you know, by describe, you can describe a, a person to someone else. And the way you do that is with words. So the person you talk to has never met a person. So you're saying, oh, this person, she is a musician. She can play, uh, Pink Floyd guitar solo is the second one, which is a little bit more epic than the first one in the song Comfortably Numb, very well. Uh, she is quite lively. She's five foot four. What we're doing here, we're describing this person in words. That's the style of the left hemisphere, this, and we're also using a measurement of their height. That's, you know, these are scientific, especially the measurement right there. This is, you know, the scientific approach using words, measurements to kind of describe something. But he talks about, McGill Chris does, about how if you're describing a person like this, or for instance, if you were describing a song itself, 
that you start describing a song, it kind of misses something. Describing a person in words, you don't really get the real flavor of the person you're describing. Or if you're describing a song, or if you're describing a food, for instance, that tastes really good, or a song that sounds really awesome, describing it in words, you kind of, you can't really communicate the full impact of the thing. Because Wissen, that left hemisphere style of knowledge, it's missing something really crucial about the thing. And that is the, uh, the other side of the coin is Kennen, the right hemisphere style of knowledge. Knowledge here that depends on experience. I'll go straight to this little example right here. If you're trying to describe someone else, the, the Kennen style of knowing is basically like, you just got to meet the person. You just got to hear the song for yourself. You just got to taste the food for yourself. There's no way of actually truly communicating the, the full understanding of those things, of the person, the food, the song, without you just experiencing it for yourself. No words will capture the true essence of the thing. You just got to be there. That's Kenan. Knowledge that depends on experience, an encounter, an interaction. It's type of knowing that cannot be easily explained in words, meaning you can't explain it words or measurements either. This is something you have to experience subjectively, you know, in person. And it's a type of knowing where things are perceived as individuals. And that's in contrast to the Wissen, the left hemisphere, where in the left hemisphere, you perceive things as members of categories. You're either this or that. In the Kennan style of knowing, though, you don't perceive things as member of categories. You just are connected to the thing. You kind of see them as you and the you and the other are kind of part of the same entity. You're not separated by categories. You're just kind of connect. You're connected. You're part of the same thing, and you perceive the other thing as just an individual. It's a, a way of not categorizing. It's very difficult to describe because. <laughs> by its nature, it cannot be described easily in words. Uh, but you're perceiving or understanding the other in as an individual without categorizing, which is very difficult because we're always categorizing other people. That's like one of the main ways we know is by categorizing. But this right hemisphere style of knowing is a way of understanding or knowing, or presumably we're not categorizing. We're perceiving the other as an individual, as unique, not a member of a category. The right hemisphere is more emotionally engaged. Important aspect of that is it's more empathetic. Um, it, you, the style of knowing makes it so that you perceive others more alive, having more humanness. Um, comparing that to you know the left hemisphere, this in style, which the the things that you're knowing this way, they 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 have the feel of of a, you know them like they're a machine. They're not alive versus the Kennan style of knowing the other thing is alive, humanness. There's a sense of connection, uh, empathy, emotional engagement with that other, even if it's not an actual person. For instance, a, a piece of music, he talks about the idea that you become emotionally engaged with a piece of music. Emotion, music can be very strongly emotionally evocative, make people cry or you know get the, the chills and stuff because it's kind of like you perceive the music as a person. They become, it has human qualities in, in some sense. And perceiving that thing as having those human qualities activates kind of this mo emotional system, which is associated with the kin and form of knowing, the right hemisphere style of knowing. Uh, and then finally, the canon style of knowing is, it instills a sense of change, movement, flow, evolution, which once again, in contrast with the, the left hemisphere style, which instills a sense of fixedness, stati staticity, I believe I'm pronouncing that right. The left hemisphere, once again, you're grabbing the thing out of its out of the flow, you, you're removing it from the flow and you make it s stick, it's stuck, it's not moving, it's static. That's the left hemisphere of Wissen style. The canon is just is the opposite. It's you're leaving the thing in kind of the flowing way that it is 
out in the world uh, and you understand it as part of the as you know constantly changing constantly evolving constantly in, in motion once again it's a very hard to like consciously understand what this means because the way we consciously understand things tends to involve grabbing the thing and making it static and that's the way we understand it so it's hard to kind of even understand what it means to under to have a sense of change or evolution about something that's constantly moving you can't really consciously be aware of something which is constantly moving the only way we really know how to be consciously aware of something is by making it stop moving so that that's if some of this stuff is hard to understand i mean i'm with you um some of these things are you have to use your left hemisphere kind of ironically to understand some of these ideas of the right hemisphere and the, it's it's a difficult thing uh to do um so going back this is all talking about each hemisphere possesses its own unique way of knowing this is a speculation that's what i was talking about and it's a speculation in the sense that well, none of those things I just talked about, there is not specific scientific studies that, you know, that describe the hemispheres in this exact way. You know, the, in the previous studies, previous chapters, rather, were chapters one and two, he described the hemispheres as differing in their attentional style, attention, which is a psychological construct that's operationally defined. You know, you, a lot of studies study a lot of experiments study attention. This term knowing though, it's it's more of a philosophical term. There aren't psychology or cognitive neuroscience papers where the, the construct in the paper, the thing which is studied is different ways of knowing. This is a this is a term which is just not really used in psychology or cognitive neuroscience. It's more of like a philosoph philosophical term. So he's moving away from kind of the the science. He's moving away from the facts, going back to this quote. This quote right here that I read earlier. Um, uh, he is he in previous chapters followed neuropsychological practice, focusing on focusing on discrete tasks and functions that can be defined and measured. Um, you know, uh, thinking about facts, but now he wants to look things in a in a different light, and that's the speculations. The first one I talked about is this way of knowing. It's a speculation because it's moving in more of a philosophical direction away from the science. The science term would be attention, but now he's using a different term. So he's getting more out there, more in the philosophical realm. The left hemisphere is the next one. The left hemisphere is individualistic and competitive. There's no real studies that show this. But this is the idea here is that the left hemisphere evolved for the sense of, for the purpose of providing a competitive advantage of the owner of the left hemisphere compared to everyone else. That's why it's competitive. It left hemisphere, your left hemisphere is meant to give you an advantage over everyone else. That's why it's individualistic. It's about you having an advantage, the owner of the left hemisphere having the advantage over others. On the other hand, and there's no studies really that show this. So it's, it's a speculation because there's not really studies that suggest that this is the case. Similar with the right hemisphere, it's characterized in this chapter, chapter three, as being collective, connected to or engaged with others. It's kind of the opposite of the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere, it's all about the individual competing with others. The right hemisphere is about being connected to other people. It's right hemisphere is like being on the same team. All of those things that are out there in the world when you use that right hemisphere style of knowing, you kind of become one, you become part of the same team and that's the way you understand them. That's what's meant by collective, co collective or connect, being connected to, engaged with the world compared to the left hemisphere, whereas there's this emotional distance. Left hemisphere is you know, emotionally removed. The right hemisphere is more emotionally engaged. Um, and there's these are the speculations because even though there's some scientific findings that support some of these ideas, like the right hemisphere is more emotionally engaged than the left, the kind of ideas presented here that the left hemisphere kind of evolved to provide a competitive advantage. The right hemisphere kind of evolved to, to make it so that uh, people can be connected to things out in the world. These are kind of speculations. It's hard to demonstrate those types of things scientifically. These are big picture speculations, which it's not clear how you would ever demonstrate something like this. The purpose of the left hemisphere is 
to get a competitive advantage. The purpose of the right hemisphere is to help an individual be connected or engaged with other things out there in the world. How would you just show that scientifically? Um, another big picture speculation here, which is kind of related to these actually, just basically all, chapter three is presents an evolutionary theory of music and language. Basically the idea without getting too into it, music supposedly evolved first and then language kind of came out of music. So I guess I'll give an example. So music, uh, it, the idea is that you, you can communicate ideas with kind of sounds where the sound that you produce is related to the meaning of the sound. So like, mm -hmm. that like, you know, means I'm sad and mm -hmm. that's kind of like, you know, at attention or excited, those different, the nature of the sounds is kind of related to the, the meaning that, that I'm trying to convey with those different sounds. And so that's what's kind of meant by the, the, the musical aspects of the music evolved first in the sense that the early type of language was actually a musical type of language where there weren't words per se, there were sounds and those sounds could communicate meaning to others. Related to this is the idea that music also evolved for this collective, to be collective in the sense that music provided a way for people a long time ago, they would kind of create music together and it was like a bonding type of, of thing. It created a sense of being a part of the same team to make, you know, create basic music together. So that stuff evolved first. And then language as we know it now came as a result of those early capabilities. So there's a lot to this theory, it really flushes it out a lot. And there's some speculations kind of embedded in this. And evolutionary theories are kind of inherently speculative because there's no scientific experiment which could demonstrate them convincingly. And so, yeah, these three are kind of all kind of related to evolutionary theories. And so that they're all kind of speculative because evolutionary theories are kind of inherently speculative. Uh, and finally, this is probably the most important big picture speculation in this chapter, the idea that the left hemisphere has revolted against the right hemisphere. This is definitely one of the themes of the book. It's kind of like the left, I mean, I'm paraphrased, but the left hemisphere is kind of bad or it's like the bad guy and the right hemisphere is kind of the good guy. The left hemisphere has taken over control and it's overpowering the right hemisphere. Once again, there's not really a scientific study which has demonstrated that. He's speculating. He's looking at some scientific facts and he's looking a little bit beyond those facts. And that can describe a lot of the stuff on this page. Their scientific findings, but he's looking beyond the findings now. He's making generalizations which go beyond the findings that you would see in a scientific journal, scientific article. So some of the evidence, if you want to call it that, some of the story that he says when he's talking about the left hemisphere revolting from the right hemisphere, overpowering the, the right hemisphere. These two little bullet points right here. I really like the Buba Kiki example. So the, the idea here is that language used to be different a long time ago, as I've already kind of hinted, it was more musical. The, 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 the sounds that we presumably made a long, long time ago to communicate before we had form language like we have now, the sounds meant the meaning of the words. The sounds were not arbitrary meaning so the sounds of the words were not arbitrary were less arbitrary in the sense that the sounds that you made basically was the meaning of the word and that's not the way things are today the words today are arbitrary there's well i mean there's some exceptions to this but for the most part the you you we name things but the meaning of the thing is not clearly connected to the sound of the thing but there are some examples 
which kind of illustrate that this is things could have been this way. And the Bu the Buha Kiki example is is one of them. Uh, so these two terms right here, these are kind of musical words. So these are not actually part of any language, but this kind of illustrates the possibility that language could work in this way. And this may be the way it did way back in the past when it was language was more musical. Um, Buba and Kiki made up words, but if you show people these pictures and you say, which one's Buba, which one's Kiki, almost everyone says this is Buba and this one is Kiki. And the idea is that this one's Buba, it's soft and round, kind of like the sound Buba, soft and round when you say it. Kiki is kind of sharp when you say it. And so this one is sharp visually, Kiki is sharp in the sound. This thing is, is kind of soft and round visually and Buba is kind of soft and round auditorily when you hear it. And so this is an example of kind of that musical type language, which presumably was the way things are were a, a long time ago where all of the communication of the sounds were very closely connected to the meaning of the sound. And this, this is not the way things are. This is kind of the exception. Most, for the most part, the words in our current language, the meaning of the words has almost is not connected to the sound for the most part. And so this is the idea that the left hemisphere, which is the hemisphere, which is removed from you know the, the musical as the left hemisphere um, the is not musical it is it can represent the meaning of things through words but the sound of the words has nothing to do with the actual thing itself it's just a representation the word is just a placeholder it's not it doesn't connect to the to the thing it represents in any type of of you know, way like this, like this does at least. Um, so that's one kind of idea about how the left hemisphere is result, revolting against the right hemisphere because our language is not like this anymore. Perhaps uh, the more compelling out of these two bullet points is just the fact that a lot of scientists and Miguel Christ accuses them of neglecting or being blind to all of the contributions of the right hemisphere. Miguel Christ suggests that scientific thinking as we've kind of established the Vissen, this is the left hemisphere style of thinking using facts, words, and measurements. That's the left hemisphere kind of style and think of thinking, which in scientists, he's, he's accused of focused on the left hemisphere. And he's, he's basically suggested scientists have focused on the left hemisphere because Scientists have really good, strong left hemispheres and the, the left hemisphere has a way of kind of only thinking about itself and it's, you know, being competitive with other things in the world. The left hemisphere is kind of like, I don't know if selfish is the right word, but the left hemisphere um, has a way of focus, you know, he calls it a self-reflexive system. It only really knows things that are part of the system. And scientists, he says, are guilty of this. And so their left hemispheres have kind of dominate their scientific approach. And so the right hemisphere, they kind of ignore, that's what he's accused them of. And it's related to kind of this bigger idea that the left hemisphere has revolted against the right hemisphere. He provides other little anecdotes and stories about this uh, in the book. This is definitely a bigger picture idea. Um, over time, the left hemisphere has become dominant over the right hemisphere. Definitely the big, probably the biggest picture idea, or one of the biggest picture ideas uh, in the book. And he talks about in, in these later chapters that we're going to, we're coming to, um, that you guys are reading right now about how this, the dominance of the left hemisphere causes problems in our modern society. And it causes some types of mental illness. Okay, so almost done here. I just want to provide some topic ideas for option one and two. Here's two of them for option one. Remember this is compare and contrast Gazaniga and McGilchrist uh, books on some topic, including connecting that the topic to the bigger picture ideas in the master and, uh, and his emissary. Uh, and, then just, and then describing whether you find the ideas master and his emissary compelling related to your topic. 
Uh, so one topic definitely would work because it's covered in both books would be hemispheric asymmetry and language um, and music and their evolution. There's definitely a lot about hemispheric asymmetry and language, especially regarding the left hemisphere. The book, your textbook, as, as McGilchrist accuses it, the textbook definitely talks a lot more about the left hemisphere than it does the right. And it also talks a lot more about language than it does music, which is like, you know more of a right hemisphere thing. Um, so that's kind of interesting right there. The, the book talks a lot more about the left hemisphere and language than it does the right hemisphere and music. That is the, the textbook, the Gazanica textbook. You could talk about hemispheric differences regarding these things and their evolution. Miguel Chris definitely did that. I was talking about some of that earlier. Um, the textbook, though, does kind of talk about these ideas in different chapters, which kind of makes it nice, um, but it also means you have to kind of read different things. So... Um, the hemispheric asymmetry chapter, uh, yeah, chapter four does have some about the evolution of hemispheric asymmetry. So that's relevant. Uh, and then the chapter about language, I believe it's 11, there is there is uh, something about the evolution of language there. And there's scattered in uh, the language chapter. And I think the hemispheric asymmetry chapter, there is a couple things about music. So there's way more about language, but there are some things about music in the textbook. That in itself is kind of an interesting point you could make is that the book, the textbook spends a lot of time talking about language compared to music. Um, and then their evolution. Yeah, so the evolution is, the ideas about evolution are kind of just scattered around the textbook, uh, but there's definitely at least one in chapter four discussion and then one in chapter 11 discussion about evolution in relation to these things. Um, and then another idea, the evolution of language and its relationship to bodily movement, gesture. Um, it's kind of similar to this one, but yeah, I'm talking about now gesture instead of music. Um, we're still talking about evolution. So a lot of the same readings that would be relevant to language and music in the textbook would also be relevant to this topic right here. When we're talking about bodily movement and gesture. One example of the gesture is definitely the left hemisphere. This would be the gesture, which kind of represents, um, you know, the, the, the style of knowing of the left hemisphere. Um, and the idea is that the same parts of the brain, which are involved with some type of gestures in the left hemisphere are also very close to parts of the, the left hemisphere in the brain, which are important for different aspects of language, suggesting there might be kind of a, core thing between these different types of actual motor gestures and the language capacity. And they might have kind of co-evolved. Um, so there's a lot more to this than I'm telling right here. Uh, you read about it in chapter three, but it would be another potential topic idea for option number one. Getting anything in the notes. I feel like I put something in the notes there. Yeah, so I guess, well, yeah, I mean, this, I kind of said this stuff earlier, but it's relevant to kind of the bigger picture things for, uh, for these, um, which is part of the option one assignment. Um, master's emissary music, right hemisphere. Um, music emerges from the hemisphere, which is collective, the right hemisphere, the one, the hemisphere, which is embodied language as we currently understand it in modern western society emerges from the other hemisphere the hemisphere which is competitive the left hemisphere um kind of one of the bigger that one of maybe the one of the, the core bigger picture speculations in the book is that that individualistic hemisphere has revolted against the collective hemisphere and that has caused problems in modern western society one more thing is an option two right here, topic idea. So these are two different quotes, but they're both basically the same idea. So I put them together. Here are the citations. Um, and it's related to some of the stuff that I was just talking about. The development of language in children um, confirms that the musical aspects of language do indeed come first. So this, there's actually, this is talking about like in children children develop musical listening skills to process the musical aspects of language. You know, like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, 
those types of things. Children are sensitive to those things and their meanings earlier than the kind of the representational aspects of language. Um, they can understand the, the musical aspects of language early in their lives and they're still very young, but then the aspects of language which are arbitrary, like words and their meaning, especially when the sounds of the words is arbitrary, that is it's not actually connected to the meaning of the thing you know, grammar, those different aspects of language, those develop later. Knowledge of music, musical skills, musical listening skills develop first. And then li the linguistic skills like understanding language as we know it today develop later on uh, in a person's life. Uh, and then the, the other quote, which is related to this, these capacities for distinguishing the char characteristic inflections of language, they rely on the right hemisphere, holistic processing, uh, and capable of making fine discriminations in global patterns and having little to do with the analytic processing of language by the left hemisphere. So basically what it's saying is that these musical capabilities develop first and that these musical capabilities are based on the right hemisphere and that later in development, children, when they start to develop you know, tradition like language as we currently know it, you know, modern language skills, they're using more of their left hemisphere to do that. So the right hemisphere is kind of prominent early on in the life when these musical skills are being developed in a, in a child or baby, but then it kind of shifts over to the left hemisphere later on when these more modern language skills are being acquired. So the citations for those are right here. So that'd be another example of potential option two. Remember for this one, there's a claim or a set of claims which are related, which you have to evaluate by reading at least two of the articles which are cited, um, describing those articles in detail. And then, then you say, or you, you kind of write about, is the claim which is being made or these claims, are they supported by the articles that were that were provided in support of those claim that claim or claims, so that's it. Yeah, this is a pretty long one. I hope this was informative. I still suggest you guys, if you have questions about this, definitely feel free to set up office hours appointments. Those are almost always very very helpful when students talk to me. A lot of times people are scared about this paper. They just don't really know what they're going to. They have like rough. They kind of have cloudy ideas of what they want to do. But then we talk to me and then they can get a clear idea of what they're wanting to do. And then things, things can, can finish quite fine, quite well, once you have a conversation with me. Uh, so yeah, that's my suggestion. I will see you guys tomorrow.